understood that reference. The end of this review marathon is here. So after Sucker Punch concluded their time with Sly with Honor Among Thieves, they set sail to work on the Infamous series for PS3, and for the time, Sly was given a long break, only showing up on select PlayStation crossovers and having the trilogy ported to PS3. But there was something within the latter that was notable. The reward for beating all the games on that collection was a teaser for a potential fourth installment. Fans were intrigued and wanted more, amplified by those guest appearances mentioned earlier. Then comes E3 2011, where we officially got a reveal and a title. Sly Cooper Thieves in Time. Okay, there was no number, but hey, new Sly game on new hardware, yay! And as more of the game was being unveiled from that moment until release, one of the biggest things that was noted was the fact that Sucker Punch was not the game's developer. Instead, we got Sanzaru Games, who at the time were most known for the Sly collection on PS3, although they did have a few more games they worked on prior. There was definitely some skepticism going in since we're dealing with a new developer, but there was also hope that they turned out something good for Sly, given their work on the PS3 collection. So we get to release and... It's interesting. If you were to take a survey on what people think of this game, there'd be a lot of people saying they had a great time with it and welcome it among Sly's legacy, but also a lot of people who think it's a terrible follow-up and offset it from the rest. So the better word for the current reception is... Divisive? And this is where I step in. Like Wiz with the previous three, I haven't played this game in a while, but I do remember absolutely loving it back when I first played it, even going as far as to outright preferring it over the original trilogy. There was so much I loved about it then, and it acted as sort of a motivation to revisit this franchise to see what I think of them now. Needless to say, I was looking forward to replaying this one the most. So, one last heist everyone? Last time on the saga of Raccoon and Studis, the gang was successful with their tasks at the end of the last game, and they decided to disband and retire. Now Murray's out in Demolition Derby with the van, Bentley and Penelope have built their own lab so they can work on a time machine, wink, wink, and Sly faked amnesia just so he can enjoy a life of peace with Carmelita. And that was that. Until Bentley finds out that Cooper history is being completely erased. So that pretty much prompts the gang to get back together, well, just Sly, Bentley, and Murray with Dimitri on book guard duty, and go off through time to set things back to the way they were. From there, we get all the big villains, characters like Carmelita getting roped into the conflict, all that good stuff. Now, this plot in general is about as simple as Sly 3s, or maybe even Sly 1s. Clear-cut heroes, clear-cut villains, but this plot honestly makes the best of it. With Cooper history being tampered with here, there's clearly a lot of personal and more dangerous stakes at play here, so time travel being a central point makes sense, and despite that being the case, it doesn't quite fall into many of the same traps that stories with time travel have. Nothing comes overly convoluted, and things are kept straight and expanded upon to give everything and everyone a purpose. There's a reason to help out the ancestors, aside from just fan service, and I do like how well it's defined to make it not feel forced and phony. On top of doing all it can to make the character interactions between them and the gang that much more fun, based on how well they bounce off each other, and how much their lack of knowledge about things in Sly's present day makes for some really funny character moments. Naturally. Thanks, Bentley. Son, who is it you keep talking to? Uh, I have a thing in my ear that lets me talk to my friend. And now he's telling me you need to carry some of that TNT so we can blow the gate. Sure, I got voices in my head telling me to blow things up too. The Black Knight can use them to monitor our movements and conversations. Pray tell, how can such a thing be possible? It's complicated. Let's just say those balloons have machines that are like eyes and ears that can detect things at great distance. And you are the only one who can reach them. Say no more! I shall go forth to smash these airborne demons, lest they set their wicked gaze upon us. We need to get in there so we can plant a bug and find out what's going on. I do not understand. How will putting an insect in there tell us anything? At most, it will just annoy her. No, not that kind of bug. This is a small device that can transmit sound so we can listen to her conversations. Oh, does it also bite? 
Gotta give credit to the writers for actually making each ancestor have a lot of different personality traits instead of just having them be some wise, all-powerful sage. For example, Ryuichi is very calm and collected and does his best not to be shaken by a lot, despite the current circumstance, but he also remains respectable and even gets a funny reaction every once in a while. Tennessee definitely has a lot of aspects for a cowboy, witty remarks and all, but he still does have standards when it comes to his family name, or even towards Carmelita. Bob is basically a giant teddy bear who doesn't know how to speak, and I love him. Salim, while knowledgeable, doesn't want any part of this conflict and just wants to eat in peace. And my personal favorite of the ancestors here, Sir Galath, takes his knightly duties way too much to his head and constantly uses them to act overdramatic by taking down all his enemies. Basically think Owain from Fire Emblem if it's theatrics reference to the Tales of King Arthur. I love him so much. I also do like how many moments of character development the rest of the gang get throughout the adventure. Because of what they have been through and what happens here, I do like how everyone reacts the way they do and how they handle each situation they're put in, which in the case of Carmelita is incredibly refreshing. After how much the attempt to give her more significance in Sly 2 fell flat in my opinion, and how little work was done with her in Sly 3, aside from a few instances, the amount of screen time and development she gets here is so welcome. Needless to say, I liked her the most here, and the villains are probably my favorite set in the series. They're so vibrant, funny, and diabolical, and their presence honestly makes me excited for what the game has in store next. Al Jefe's great, Toothpick's great, The Grizz is great, and there's even some things I like about Miss Decibel. Now, I'm leaving out two villains, but that's because from here on out in this segment, I'm going to go into spoiler territory. Skip to this time frame if you want to hear the final cliff note version of what I think about the story, giving you three seconds. Alright then, so the main villain is Cyril Paradox. I think in general, he's fine, but I do think he could have been a lot more. He does have an understandable motivation, as the Cooper legacy completely undermined his own families, and he wants to reverse that. And I do like his overall plan of screwing with time to gain power through deceitful means, and using his art stories as a cover-up, but he sort of falls under the same issues I had with Arpeggio back in Sly 2. Aside from the silhouette of him being seen after Al Jefe's fight in Chapter 1, an appearance in a flashback told by Carmelita in Chapter 2, and a few name drops, Le Paradox does not gain a presence until Chapter 5, in which he doesn't start parading around until the fight with Miss Decibel at the very end, before actually getting a few moments in Chapter 6. For someone trying to erase history, I kinda wish we got to meet Le Paradox sooner, like actually giving him a brief role to see what the public thinks he is at first, before showing us what he actually is later on, or, if they wanted to stick with what he does have, then I wish they made him either funnier or way more evil, similar to what was done with Dr. M back in Sly 3, who also had a small bit of screen time before Sly 3's final chapter, but was given just the right amount of screen time and development for you to get what he's like. I know I said that his motivations are little more than a temper tantrum in a video from a year ago, but looking at it now, I think it had a good setup, but he needed some funnier or more intimidating moments or stronger buildup. At least he isn't shafted from the title of main villain like Arpeggio was. And for that last villain... Okay, let's address that elephant in the room. I should have known it was you, hideous hoodlums. Uh, not that one. So you know how I mentioned that Bentley and Penelope were working on a time machine, yet I neglected to mention her when I talked about the Cooper gang reassembling? That's because when these time shenanigans started happening, Penelope mysteriously vanished. And it takes until Chapter 4, where we find out that the villain of that chapter, the Black Knight, is actually Penelope in a mech suit. Not brainwashed or anything like that. She legit chose to betray the Cooper Gang and sell the time traveling equipment to La Paradox, essentially kickstarting this whole adventure. Why did she do this? Because she actually believed Sly was overall having a negative impact on Bentley's talent. Because most of what Bentley worked on was for Sly's sake and for thieving by proxy, Penelope believed that he could be using what he's capable of for greater causes, or if he wanted to be a criminal, for much grander criminal purposes. Now, this twist has undoubtedly been a breaking point for many people who play this game, and is generally seen as a bad twist at best, and a betrayal of characters at worst. Now, here's why I don't hate it. When I really took a step back to think about it, the fact that Bentley would do many of these things and make that much equipment for Sly would easily lead to Sly becoming rather reliant on these skills rather than any sort of friendship. Honestly, kind of like how Sly's father treated Dr. M. While we do know that Sly would never treat Bentley that sort of way, and those two would always treat each other like buddies, how exactly is Penelope supposed to know all this? From her perspective, she had yet to see any examples of Sly and Bentley's strong relationship, like Sly saving him or something. In fact, when Penelope was with the group in Sly 3, and Bentley was in trouble during the climax of Episode 5, she was the one to help him out, not Sly. So it's likely that the two were in fact growing closer, but Bentley not willing to put that part of his past behind him, is what eventually drove Penelope down this path. 
Replaying the series has made me realize that there was probably more thought going into this twist and this character than we thought. I mean, I'd be lying if I said that this twist was perfect, as the build-up could have been a little better, like showing signs of this at earlier points of the game, maybe even Sly 3, but thinking about it in depth has given me a new way to look at this decision, and appreciate the writers for trying something this gutsy. Maybe some of my facts are wrong, but at the end of the day, I like what they did here. Now, I'm not going to jinx the ending, but I'm just going to say that I agree it's absolutely terrible. It feels like it was written in a few minutes, and it really leaves a bad taste in your mouth, especially nowadays knowing that a proper conclusion still hasn't happened. So for those who skipped the spoilers, here's the cliff note version. Aside from a few portions with the main villain and the ending, I honestly really enjoy this story. The writing is even funnier, and despite all the directions and character motivations, it remains completely focused on the point it wants to get across, and outputs it very well. I definitely laughed a lot, and I was always excited to see what would happen next. Well, this series has moved up to Generation 8 years into the future, so it had to take an all-new approach to the looks. And if the intent of the art styles of the previous games was to make it feel like a Saturday morning cartoon that you could play, then I'd say that Thieves in Time absolutely does the best job conveying that, because this game looks marvelous. The color palette is so vibrant, and the shading is just right that everything just pops. The time travel element does wonders for the aesthetics, and they help make the worlds the most diverse they've been thus far. I love how they nail the details for villages of both feudal Japan and classic England at night. The prehistoric pit has a ton of great details. They got everything right in designing a town in the Old West, and the way they present a town in Arabia is almost hypnotizing. Unfortunately, there's not a time of day shift like there is in Sly 3, but for as gorgeous as these locations are, it's easy to look past. I just get lost in these details thanks to how well everything is animated. I actually like the slight redesigns for the characters, and the way they are animated in gameplay and mid-game cutscenes are even more fluid than before. We've definitely come a long way from the PS2 days, because now everyone moves and expresses themselves as if they were from a 3D animated film, which does wonders for keeping up with the plot, and makes admiring everything during gameplay even more fun, right down to looking at the characters' idle animations. You know what else makes the story mode more fun to follow? Well, for one thing, the cinematics. It's kind of funny that I made that comparison, because they're completely 2D animated now. As someone who loves hand-drawn 2D animation, I am so happy they took this direction. They overall look better in terms of style, and there's more of them to boot. They made some for the middle portions of the chapters, not just for the start and the end, which I love. And for another thing, the voice acting. This game, hands down, has the best performances in this series, with every comedic line and serious moment being delivered with just the right amount of enthusiasm. Kevin Miller, Matt Olson, and Chris Murphy absolutely did their best here, and Carmelita didn't get the short end of the stick this time. Done by Great Elisle, yes, that Great Elisle, I feel like this conveys who Carmelita is as best as possible, and each delivery is spot on. She should be kept in this role, hands down. While on that, it's cool to see how many notable voice actors we have here. I already mentioned Great Elisle, but we also got Nolan North in two roles, even though Bob doesn't talk normally. Patrick Seitz, of all people, provided his voice, and here's another reason why Gallus is my favorite ancestor. He's voiced by Yuri Lowenthal. How many other heroes fight crime and fix your shower? I'll always be happy to see him no matter where he shows up. It's also easier to appreciate the voice acting, since there's actually more dialogue in normal gameplay this time. It doesn't happen all the time, but during missions, the characters will leave comments about the current situation and what they think about it. There are a few instances of some lines repeating themselves, but it doesn't happen too frequently, and for the most part, the lines trigger when necessary, which I do actually appreciate, and use as a way to understand these characters more. And there's something else that helps me get lost in these environments, and enhances the journey with these characters more. The soundtrack. This game probably has my favorite OST in the entire series. It knows how to use different instrumentation for the different time periods, it knows when to be atmospheric, when to be cinematic, when to rock out, when to be somber, and when to just fit the scene at hand. The overworld themes are just a joy to listen to when wandering around the map doing whatever, and when things start to heat up, the music goes all in, and it's great! Now there is one thing I want to talk about this game's presentation that's more on the debatable side, from what I've seen, and that's the performance. There's a lot of people who say the game wasn't well optimized for this console, and honestly, I don't agree with that. I mean, I see traces of what they're talking about, as there are occasional frame drops and a few times where the game stutters, but from my perspective, it never got to a point where it actually interfered with the ability to play. Frame drops happened very infrequently, and stutters even less so, and even times where I did notice them was when the game was running a lot of things within close proximity of one another, which didn't last very long. Everywhere else, the game ran perfectly at 60 frames per second, with no glitches to be seen. In fact, I should think the frame drops were worse in Sly 3 than they are here, so really, it's perfectly manageable. Though despite not seeing that many bad frame rate issues, I agree that the load times are one of the biggest problems with the game. 
There are a few that only take a couple seconds, which I'm okay with, but then you get some that can take somewhere above a minute, depending on what's being loaded. Load times don't usually bother me, but when it gets to a point where it feels like I can leave the game running, make a sandwich, and come back to find it still loading, that is just flat out ridiculous. And it really does become more noticeable when it's with the game's wonderful pacing, which will be brought up later. And for one more thing I like about how this game is presented, it's clear that Sansru really liked the original trilogy, because there are a lot of references scattered throughout. There's only a small bit within the story itself, like past events or villains being brought up, or Sly getting the idea to use his wonderful Italian accent. The other boys are out to seek. Uh, there's something about the snake bites. But there are way more in the background that are just really nice to find. But they never interfere with the plot, and don't have an inch of, Hey, remember this from the previous games? Rather, they feel like they just act as a smaller part of the bigger package. There's plenty of new in the foreground to go with it. So I think this game absolutely nails what it wants to do with the presentation, from art style to fidelity to sound quality and it really added a lot to the overall adventure. So Sansaru just decided to build upon what was done in slide 2 and 3 in terms of structure for this installment. You've still got different hub worlds to explore, with missions to do in them, which all culminate in a big heist where you beat the villain of the day before going on to the next one. But hey, for this series, I would have it no other way. Slay is pretty much the same as he was previously, especially early on, but now he can wear costumes to help him out in levels. This was a feature present in Sly 3, but it was mostly just for specific missions, and make sure some guards didn't notice you, and that's it. Here, it's given a lot more prominence. Only a select few costumes are able to fool guards, but their main purpose is for level traversal and task solving. The samurai armor makes Sly immune to fire and lets him parry fireballs. The jailbird costume lets him move giant blocks and roll around. The sabertooth costume lets him play dead and do this pounce which goes super far. The archer costume lets him shoot arrows and make tight ropes to walk across, and the Raven Thief costume lets him slow down time and slice things with his giant scimitar. Even though there are drawbacks to using these, like Sly not being able to use any of his Thief Net upgrades, and his ground speed being cut immensely in the case of the Samurai Shieldboard and Sabertooth costumes, these feel like extensions to what he can do, rather than gimmicks. While one chapter only requires a lot of use out of the costume you get in it to just finish the game, like the samurai armor seeing the most use in Japan, the archer seeing the most use in England, and so on and so forth, the fact that you can use these whenever you want, and how many puzzles there are with them, and how many secrets can open up, really gives these more purpose than they would have otherwise. Each map has secret areas that require costumes other than the one you got in it, which while that doesn't mean you have to backtrack in order to get some extras, it also means they have more thought put into them outside of what their chapter might suggest. These are a great addition, and they make traversing the map and the missions even more fun. As for Bentley, they flat out improved him from Sly 3. Sadly, he can't quadruple jump anymore, but he comes with a jet engine he can use for hovering, a way to throw bombs, and a way to pickpocket already on him. It's still not ideal to get into fights with him, but his playstyle feels even smoother than ever before, and the Thief Net upgrades can deck him out big time, but one step at a time here. As for Murray, aside from his Thief Net upgrades, he's pretty much the same. Okay, his pickpocketing is much more orthodox since the money immediately goes into your pocket now, but still not a whole lot of changes to note. Although since I enjoyed playing as him back then, I enjoy playing as him now. Carmely is the only Sly 3 playable character returning here, and I'm so happy to say that she was improved as well. She can move normally now, no more constant strafing, and she gets a huge variety of modes for her shock pistol, essentially one-upping how she played back then. Pity you don't get to play as her very much in missions, and playing as her in the overworld has little point, aside from just potential fun or treasures out in the open you might have missed, but I'll take what I can get. These are the characters that you have throughout the course of the game, but each of the five chapters has one of Sly's ancestors for that last slot. Ryoichi Cooper for Chapter 1, Tennessee Kid Cooper for Chapter 2, Bob Cooper for Chapter 3, Sir Galeth Cooper for Chapter 4, and Salim al Kapar for Chapter 5. On surface level, each one is basically the same as Sly, without the Thief Nav grades. Except for maybe Bob, who can't interact with the usual glowing objects like climbable poles and rope lines, yet can pickpocket using a... giant bone. But then make up for that with having one signature ability that Sly can never have. Ryuichi can jump between spire points, Tessie's cane is also partially a gun, complete with a crack shot mode, Galeth can catapult higher than normal off of gravel points, and Sleep can climb bowls very quickly. They each have their own missions built with this in mind, and there are even a few secrets that require their abilities, so I welcome them regardless. Granted, when you start decking out Sly, there is a relative gap between them, but their missions add in their own brand of fun, on top of their interactions with the other characters, so I'm cool with this. So I mentioned how they're implemented into the worlds, and how the worlds themselves look, so... How are they from a gameplay perspective? They are my favorite set of levels in the franchise, of course! They are much larger than anything from the other games, but there's a lot more things to do in them that make all this space worth it. 
It's fun to pickpocket guards for money and treasures, which once again get added to your wallet automatically, and each one has a unique way to get around, like the Old West having this train track, England having catapults, and the prehistoric era having these wind drafts you can ride on. The missions they host also have some of the most imaginative platforming I've seen in a 3D platformer, taking full advantage of what everyone can do, yet sticking to what the series laid out. There really isn't a mission in the game I don't enjoy playing when just going by how they are constructed. Honestly, it reminds me of the more fictitious design from Sly 1, while still being places I could imagine existing. But if you like collecting more, well these hubs have got you covered. Clue bottles and treasures are back from Sly 2, there's now mess, and the game even has trophies as a method of completion. So back in Sly 2, I felt that the clue bottles were a little too easy to hunt down, and they by themselves weren't all that strong of a method for extending game time, not helped by the rewards not being worth it. I am happy to say that Sansaru took note of this and rectified this issue. Each level does have some easy to spot bottles, but a lot of them are very craftily hidden and will require a keen eye and maybe even a costume to look out for. And the rewards you get are much more worth it, as these upgrades are permanent, they're not just equipable. Much better. Treasures are pretty much the same way. Some are easy pickings, but also require more of an eye or even a costume to get to. But since all of them are timed, you need to think of what route you're going to take in order to get back to the hideout. Only select few get really picky, but for the most part, they give you enough time to think, yet still keep you on the move. So I really do like these. Not to mention some of the treasures reverence not only previous games, but even different game franchises entirely. Hi Daxter. <laughs> but these also give you money that you can use on Thiefnet upgrades, so it's worth going after them for that alone. I've mentioned those a lot, so it's time for me to say that the Thiefnet upgrades are the best they've ever been. Mechanically, it's not that much different, but what you do get from them makes it all worth it. Many of the great upgrades of the past return, but not only can some of them be made better, but there's even a ton more that can make getting around and fighting enemies more fun, and also some processes like pickpocketing, using something that requires your gadget meter, or even just running around so much more convenient. And towards the end, using these powers all together makes you feel like a superhero, especially if you decide to go treasure hunting in the hubs or replay missions. Though with all that in mind, I really don't approve of how they handled the mess. The trophies are for the most part fine, though there are some that fall into the trap of becoming worse in post-game than they are in the main journey. But the mess are another thing entirely. In concept, they're not a whole lot different than the rest, just something to keep your eye out for. But they do need you some cool cosmetics for your characters, the paraglider, and the cane. But there's one flaw that makes hunting for them not fun. They can be hidden in missions. Regardless of a mission you're on is more linear, or a bit more open-ended, they can have a massacre or two hidden within them, something you won't figure out until you just see it for yourself. The closest thing you have to knowing that is the level select telling you that there are maps within that chapter. That's it. It doesn't tell you which ones in the hub world you got, or which ones in the missions, or the arcade minigames you got. You are completely blind when looking for them. And guess what? Even if the mask is out in the open, if you miss it and go past the point of no return, you have to replay the entire mission again in order to collect it. The cosmetics you do get from it are cool, but are not worth just blindly looking around for a needle on a haystack. But thankfully, regardless if you want to go after certain collectibles, or if you just want to beat the game with new added fluff, the game has phenomenal pacing to keep you enticed. Everything feels like it's keeping the story and the character's motivations going, that regardless of how long a chapter is actually taking, it doesn't feel like it overstays its welcome. Heck, you're not even brought to a level select screen in between chapters. The end of one episode goes right into the next, which does wonders in keeping the player's engagement. And there is never a dull moment in chapters. Regardless if you're doing something in-game that requires normal gameplay, throws you into a minigame like some kind of dance desk s party, an RC vehicle section, or Bob's training montage. I would do a Make a Man Out of You joke, but we live in a YouTube climate that's stingy on movie content usage, and I don't want my channel getting another copyright strike, thank you very much. Or doing one of many hacking sections returning from last time. There's three types of hacking sections now. The first being the classic overhead shooter, just expanded upon with different types of ships to adjust the current situation, and different forms of obstacles to keep you on your toes. The second one is controlling an electric ball through a maze using the 6-axis. Tilting the controller, in other words. I'm not terribly fond of these, as the controls are a bit on the stiff side, but these are really brief, so I can brush them off. The third one, however, is... <gasps> Bentley Stallone! More akin to a side-scrolling shooter game, where your goal is just to shoot everything in sight while collecting these yellow and red orbs to grow stronger and do that more efficiently. And these grenades, which are great for crowd clearing but are one-use items, so they must be used wisely. These are probably my favorite, because it is satisfying to get stronger and just go to town on everything, but there is a strategy to this, as getting hit will cause you to lose a level, sort of like Cave Story. So the name of the game is dishing out as much as you can while staying on the move. I always look forward to these, and in the arcade machines that you get after collecting all the treasures in a chapter, these are the ones I like playing the most. And what chapter with fun missions wouldn't be complete without plenty of bosses to go along with it? Well, this is another thing I'm glad Thieves in Time realizes. 
This is a great boss lineup. Because Sanzaru didn't go nuts with any combat potential, like what was done in Sly 3, the bosses take a completely different approach. What was previously bosses that you could whack over and over while keeping the dexterity up to not get hit, is now finding out how to dodge all the bosses' attacks and find specific openings to damage them. They're a bit like puzzles in a way, but they remain incredibly fast-paced and keep your attention all the way through. Especially if the simplest way to beat them requires the usage of Sly's costumes, adding in another reason as to why I think they're great. The Grizz and Miss Decibel are personal highlights for me, but my favorite boss is definitely the end boss of Chapter 4. In fact, I think that boss might be my favorite in the series. The first phase has you working with a giant arena, dodging really wild attacks, and getting to a vantage point on top of three different pillars to shoot arrows into this giant mech's armor, in order to tear pieces off before bombing the heart. And after doing that twice, the second phase essentially becomes Mecha Punch-Out, which I'm absolutely cool with. The only boss I say I wasn't big on was the final boss. Now, I'm not going to show it for too many spoilers, but let's just say it was not the right note for the game to end on. But to me, while it is a sour point, it didn't affect how much the gameplay gets everything right for a Sly game. The gang is far more capable than they've ever been, the ancestors add in their own flair, there's tons of missions I look forward to, and even after beating the game, I was willing to go back and keep on playing to find as much as I can. Because when it comes to the goal the game has set out to do, it passes with flying colors. You know the reason I wanted to come back to Sly Cooper? This game is why. I really want to talk about how much I loved playing through this back then, and even now. I wanted to revisit it to see how much of it holds up in my eyes, and behold, it's just as good as I remember it being. I wanted to get those treasures after I beat the game, just because. And when that happens, I think it's safe to say that Thieves in Time is my favorite Sly game. I love how it plays, the feeling of progression, the really enjoyable plot, the atmosphere, the graphics, which hold up big time, and just how much there is to do and enjoy. Sanzaru Games also put a lot of heart and effort into making this game the way it is, and in my opinion, they succeeded. It's debatable whether or not this is a good starting point for those who have never touched a Sly game ever, but regardless of when you do, you will have an amazing time. I'm not really expecting many to agree, but I genuinely feel that this is something special. As a follow-up to the original PS2 trilogy, it has everything it needs to be an expansion of what made those games good. And as a game itself, Sly Cooper Thieves in Time feels just right, and I give it the highest recommendation I can. So, that's it. I have reviewed every single Sly game. In a way, I'm happy to close this off on the highest note, since I progressively got more positive about each passing entry. But in another way, I'm sort of disappointed that this is the end, given how this game ends, and some behind the scenes news, and the current decisions of Sony and Sanzaru. So apparently, according to interviews, Sanzaru had written a draft for a DLC chapter for the game that would address what happened to Sly, and find a way to save him, but before they could start developing it, Sony pulled the plug. Heck, even if this game fell into the same trap that Osiris Wrath did, having the true conclusion behind a paywall, I think it would have been better than what we actually got. And it's still bad of Sony to just not let a company do what they want with a project, regardless of profit. And it's not helped that after this, Sanzaru would do some separate game work before getting bought out by Facebook. So with them out, and with Sucker Punch having no intention to return, Sly has been stuck in limbo for 8 years now, ironically the same amount of time between the release of Honor Among Thieves and Thieves in Time. Even with desires from some voice actors, and references to it in other Sony properties, and with my own desires, I have a feeling that we're not going to see anything Sly related for quite a while, given that the TV show has apparently been in development for a very long time, does anyone remember that? And given the direction Sony wants to go in. And that's a shame, because Sanzaru really made something great here, and to see it not sell all that well, and Sony just not to follow up with anything, is just appalling. I know Sly has never been that popular compared to someone like Ratchet, and I get that companies want to focus on profit when it comes to games, but despite all that, I really recommend giving the series a shot. There will always be people who love what this raccoon left behind. I am Lightning Ripper, and go play some Sly Cooper!